so don't worry, we can sleep on your couch. It's okay, we'll let you take a nap. Aww. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I can't sleep on planes. So really? I, yeah. Even with the bed? Even if you're I don't know. I listen, I'm in United in the cheap seats. Know, I'm in that economy yeah. cheap seat. I'm on the, the upgrade list, so I have I my fingers I crossed. Yeah. Are you going back tonight? Tonight. What flight are you on? I think it's like 9.30. But um, I'm going to New York. Oh, uh, no, because I'm on yeah. at 10 o'clock going to D.C. Oh, man, brutal. Got it. When are you going back? Tomorrow morning. Oh, okay. So I don't, I don't like the short red eye from yeah. here. Yeah. You don't, because you literally get no sleep. Exactly. Yeah. Not fun. So I'll get in at like 4.30. Hawaii, I mean, you have, you have the most brutal yeah. commute yeah. of anyone. I know you said your kids are gone. Really? Um, um, no, yeah, well, he's actually here right now. I just saw him, but he he works in an investment banking firm in Boston, so he comes back. Okay, great. He does a lot on the West Coast, too, so he just sort of, you know, if I'm staying over a long weekend, he'll stay with me. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. How's everybody doing? Fabulous. I am Crystal Ball. Yes, really, that is actually my name. Um, <laughs> and I'm co-host of The Cycle on MSNBC, and I'm ho also host of Crystal Clear on Shift by MSNBC Wednesdays, 11 a.m. Not that I'm doing any shameless plugs here. Uh, and I'm really excited for this panel on women in elective office. Um, we've assembled an absolutely fabulous group of ladies who I will introduce here briefly, and then we'll jump in the conversation. Uh, and I'll start off with some questions, and then at the end, I definitely want to hear questions from the audience as well, so make sure you're thinking of things that you would like to ask these fabulous ladies. So starting over here to my left, she is a Republican Congresswoman from California, representing Orange County. She's also a former stockbroker. Please welcome Congresswoman Mimi Walters. And to my left here, she is the uh, executive advisor to global companies like De Deloitte on diversity and also founder of All In Together, which is a fabulous nonprofit working on getting women to embrace leadership in the political sphere. Please welcome Lauren Leader Chevet. Yeah. To my right is Congresswoman Tulsi Gabbard, Democratic Congresswoman from Hawaii, also one of the very first female combat veterans to serve in Congress. So, incredible woman, Tulsi Gabbard. And finally, we have the principal in charge of government regulatory affairs and public policy at PricewaterhouseCoopers, and also a founding board member of All In Together. Please welcome Laura Cox Kaplan. So I wanted to start off by asking all of these women sort of the central question, I think, which is, at this point in the United States Congress, women make up 20% of the Congress, which is still pretty dismal, uh, but it is improvement. We're right now at 72nd in the world in terms of female representation in our legislative bodies, which puts us behind places like Afghanistan and Pakistan and Saudi Arabia. So clearly there's a lot of room for improvement, but my question that I want to start to, to each of these ladies is, does it matter? Does it matter having more women in office, Congresswoman Walters? I think it absolutely does matter. Um, I'm a mom of four children, and I've sort of been seen as like the referee in my house. Um, when the kids, you know, weren't behaving, I'd be the one that had to try to solve the problems. And I think that women um, are solution-oriented, and I think that that's very important. I mean, I see you see today, um, Congress doesn't necessarily get along, and I think that women br bring a different perspective on how to solve problems. Lauren, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think there's no question, and we now actually have data that proves that it matters and it makes a difference. There's been some studies this year by this very cool organization called Quorum um, that shows that women in Congress actually are more likely than their male colleagues to work across the aisle to find co solutions that they uh, can agree on. They're also more productive and get more bills passed and out of, out of committee. But more importantly, we have a representative democracy, and women are, of course, over 50% of our population. It's unconscionable that we don't have uh, people representing us in Congress who fundamentally and viscerally understand who we are and what matters to us. What do you think, Congresswoman Gabbard? Yeah, I mean, this is really about uh, representation. We look at our representative form of government and recognizing the fact that you know half of our population still is not adequately represented. And what is what impact does that have on policy? Mm -hmm. uh, we can have many members of Congress saying, "I support women's issues. I stand strong with uh, my sisters." Uh, but when it comes right down to it, even those who have the best of intentions 
uh, end up with sometimes negative unintended consequences. I'll give you one quick example. This coming uh, in the next few days, I serve on the Armed Services Committee and I expect there will be some amendments offered to the big annual defense bill that we'll be taking up on Wednesday that have to do with holding off, delaying, or putting a stop to the uh, policy that is allowing women to serve in combat roles in the military. And it's coming from people who say, oh, I'm just looking out for our female service members and I wanna make sure that we're adequately prepared to take care of them. Uh, but it's coming, I mean, these, poli these amendments are coming from men. Uh, where now I'm, I'm grateful to be on the committee to be able to bring voice to the many, many women who have already been serving in combat for years, very effectively making their mission successful. Uh, and I think that's just one example, there are many, of what happens when you don't have women who have a seat at the table, who are able to say, hey, no, thank you for your good intentions, but this is not the right path to take. I think that's such a fabulous and concrete point. Women can come at things with a different perspective and raise issues that maybe weren't being heard before. Yeah. Sure. Laura, you have such a fascinating perspective here because you've worked with both male and female legislators. Right. So you can see up close that there are real differences overall. Sure. I think, too, you can expand it to the broader business context, too. And you look at organizations that really are the most innovative, and they're embracing, democ they're embracing d diversity in a very real way. And so when you think about the impact that more diverse corporate boards have, the impact that more diverse senior management teams have, the, the impact that more diverse groups have in terms of their ability to get things done and work together, I think there are real parallels potentially to what we could see with more diversity in Congress. And it's an area that we are uh, spending a lot of time focusing on. I think that's such an important point because if you can make the case that this is really, it's not about checking some diversity yeah, checkbox, right. right? This is about results mm -hmm. for the country. It seems to me that Congresswoman Walters, that would be an argument that would be particularly appealing to Republicans who care about the bottom line. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, um, the, we um, as Republicans haven't really done that great of a job in promoting women and we're working very hard to build the bench because we know that we need to build the bench. Um, as I said, there's more women that are, are in the population and are voting, and we bring a different perspective. And one of my goals as a member of Congress is to uh, make sure that um, I'm a mentor to many women. So you are one of, I think it's 28 Republican women now serving in Congress. This latest freshman class was a major improvement in terms of diversity. So do you yeah. think the party is doing better recruiting, reaching out to diverse groups? We absolutely are. I mean, we recognize that we have to do that. And we had five Republican women that were elected um, in this um, last election in the freshman class. We have um, an African-American woman uh, from Utah. We have the youngest woman ever elected uh, um, to Congress on the Republican side w was Such elected. A uh, we have another uh, person who was the first female fighter pilot. Um, she is just amazing. Uh, first one that was in combat uh, elected. We have a whole host of women now that we're bringing forward and grooming them for higher office. One thing that I thought was interesting about both of our incredible congresswomen here is both of them prior to making it to Congress served in these other very male-dominated fields. So you were a stockbroker, and Congresswoman Gabbard, you, were, you served in the military, which is obviously a very macho place. Is there something about that experience that prepared you for being in the ultimate <laughs> all-boys club there in Congress? Uh, many things, <laughs> many things. Uh, you know, I, I constantly look back to um, the times that I've served on active duty, the times that I was deployed uh, in my service in Congress in a few ways. I think, um, you know, those experiences have well informed um, the decisions that we're making, especially as it relates to the military and foreign policy. But I think on a broader perspective, um, it's understanding the importance of getting results um, the importance of putting the mission first, putting country first, and recognizing that that requires that you work with people from a broad variety of backgrounds, with a broad variety of ideas on exactly how we accomplish that. Mm -hmm. um, I'll never forget my first day at basic training in South Carolina. I came from Hawaii, and I was in a bay with about 85 women from all parts of the country. Um, you know, people who are coming from places I've never met, backgrounds I'd never been exposed to. And, and the cool thing there is you're one team, one team working towards one result, 
And ultimately, it's that idea, I think, that we need more of in Congress. People talk about Congress being so dysfunctional. Um, it's not a bad thing that we have people from very diverse opinions. Uh, the important part is that we have to focus on is we're working towards the same goal, which requires us to work together. Yeah, it's, I think it's a fabulous point. We've seen example after example of women members of Congress coming together and making it work. We saw Republican women come out against a very sticky abortion provision earlier this year. We just saw women who are really integral in um, pushing through the trafficking bill most recently and allowing a Senate confirmation for Loretta, Loretta Lynch to go forward. How much is it of it is just women having close relationships with each other, Congresswoman Walters, because there are fewer women there, and so there is this sort of natural bond. Yeah, absolutely. And um, in fact, I'm new. I just got elected in November, so I'm a brand new member of Congress. And one of um, the Democrat uh, members of Congress, a female, invited me to play softball. So now, even though I'm a horrible softball player, um, <laughs> it, there's a, a group of women that play softball, and they play against the press, and they play once a year. But that is an example of a great way to build the relationships and to build the bonds. So um, now I have to go practice. Uh, but <laughs> I think it's really important, and because we do, as females, share so many common issues. Now, we definitely have our differences of, of opinion course. and philosophy, but there's many areas that we do agree on. And when we're a force together, we are able to take it to the men and change the dialogue. And we, so prove, we prove that with the um, abortion issue, the right. abortion bill. I mean, right. This is really, I think, one of the big sort of unreported stories of the 114th Congress and, frankly, the story of, you know, function. Maybe it doesn't make great headlines when people actually get along in Congress, but, you know, every panel I go to, every discussion I go to that talks about what's happening in Congress today, all you hear is this sort of, you know, nothing but negative. They don't get along. They never work together. It's not like in the 80s and 90s where, you know, people would have dinners and meet their children and collaborate across the aisle. Well, the reality is that the women in Congress are doing that, yeah. even if the rest of the conferences are not. And, you know, if you believe in a functioning democracy, if you believe that our legislators are there to put country above self-interest, then you should be putting a lot of energy into electing more women on both sides of the aisle. And I think it's probably one of the most sort of important and sort of least discussed dis conversations in American politics today. The real difference that having both Republican and Democratic women in Congress is making in everything around how our government functions. Uh, that's absolutely the case. Mm -hmm. Laura, what would you say, though, to people who say, that's too simplistic? It's not just about your gender. It's a whole other complicated yeah. thing. You can't just put more women in there and expect a better result. Well, I do, I do think you want to be careful not to go to you know, too simplistic an answer, right? But the reality is diversity matters and you don't have enough of it. So it's at least one element of the problem that, you know, we can all do something to solve. I mean, the business community can play a significant role in terms of growing those numbers. I mean, some of the things that we're doing at PwC currently is looking at our overall giving strategy. We have a political action committee like most corporate entities do. And we've taken a good hard look at our giving strategy to see can we you know, give money earlier in the process, particularly for women members on both sides of the aisle who may be vulnerable? It's more difficult for, for female members to raise money than for men, which our counterparts here on the panel can talk to much more eloquently than I can. But the reality is that the studies show women make three times the number of phone calls for about the same amount of money. So if we're <laughs> able to provide more funding earlier in the process, that helps. Speaking out publicly and encouraging our counterparts in the private sector to actually embrace this notion that diversity matters, that you need more than 20% of the, of the population of Congress to be diverse. Mm -hmm. Those are incredibly uh, important components. And then the other thing that we think is really important is helping to grow the pipeline. Mm -hmm. So that you're mentoring young women, as, as Mimi said a moment ago, mentoring young, woman, young women to help them see themselves in these roles, exposing them to wonderful elected members like Tulsi and Mimi to show them this yeah. incredible example, which yeah. helps them break down the, the barriers that they may have in their own minds to show them that I can also do this. Uh, there's so much yeah. in that in that what you just said, and I want to break it into two pieces because I think the piece on fundraising is really fascinating, and we obviously have two women here who can speak directly to that. And then I also want to get back to this part of the pipeline and how we get young women in particular to see themselves as candidates. So is fundraising tougher for women? 
I know you both are fabulous <laughs> fundraisers, so it's not so much of a problem for you. But is it is it tougher for women? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I guess I, I'm not a man, so I, I would have a hard time comparing. But yeah, I mean, it's it's tough. It's tough all the way around. But I wanted to jump to the second point because I think it's it's a, an important one. Um, that I think we can take a, a layer deeper. Mm. Whereas we talk about mentorship, I think sometimes as I talk to folks, they assume that all women in Congress get together, we get along, and there's great synergy amongst all women in Congress, and that's just not the case. And I think I've seen examples of that in the military. I think you could see examples of that in the corporate world as well, where there, um, I think when we talk about mentorship, when we talk about growing the pipeline, uh, we do have to look in the mirror and say, okay, what am I doing? to reach back and help someone who's coming after me. Uh, because unfortunately there are cases, there are instances where you have women who are used to being the only one at the table and maybe they like being the only woman at the table and are not as helpful to those who are coming after um, as we think we should be as mm. a whole. So I think it's, it's sometimes a difficult thing to talk about, but I think it's the reality uh, of the experience that a lot of folks have not just in politics, but in a lot of different areas where each of us has a responsibility. We can't just point the finger out kind of in the crowd that we've got to say, okay, well, what are we doing to help bring up this next generation of women leaders in our community as a whole? Lauren, you've, you work with women at all levels. Is this an issue that you've seen of, of some women being used to being that only voice at the table? And, and frankly, for a long time in our society, there's only been room for so many women at the table. So t sometimes there's this natural instinct to feel like that's my turf. You know, I mean, I think there's no quite, we all know that that still exists. You know, what What I'm more concerned about, uh, frankly, and part of why I started the organiz my organization, is that we are not even having a basic conversation in this country today about why political and civic leadership is a valuable career objective for women. Um, in my mom's day, in the mid-70s, when she was very active in the women's movement, it was inconceivable to talk about women's leadership and not talk about political leadership as part of that equation. Mm. Today, we don't even mention it. And I go to hundreds of women's conferences around the country. The topic of seeing, you know, women are actually more likely than men to want to give back in their careers, to want to make the country better as a sort of core goal for themselves. And they do aspire to leadership in huge numbers. But when you look at the numbers of women that see political or civic leadership as a valuable kind of leadership or as a goal for their own careers, the numbers are abysmal. We have to change that. We, we need more women, especially women in business who also can, you know, have had careers who maybe could make a transition. There are a lot of really fabulous women in Congress today who've worked in the private sector. You know, there's just a huge pipeline of women out there who aspire to leadership and who want to lead but don't ever even consider the possibility of doing that in government. And some of that is because our system is maybe, you know, not the most, uh, you know, is, it appears very, you know, broken. We don't talk. But I think it's more that we don't talk about it. And, and that's, I think, part of the mentorship that Tulsi's talking about, we have to talk about this more. We mm. need women to see this as valuable. Yeah, I, sometimes I hear people say, well, there are fewer women in Congress and fewer women run for office because women are smarter than men. Mm -hmm. They don't want to mess with that <laughs> dysfunctional disaster of a body, which maybe there's a little bit of something to, but Congresswoman Walters, I'd love to hear your story of how you decided yeah. to see yourself as a candidate and to see political service as public service. Well, I was um, always interested in public service actually in high school because I had gone to a new school. I didn't know anybody. So one way that I um, got to meet people is I joined student government. Mm -hmm. And I, so I was very involved in student government in high school and college, but always knew someday that um, I wanted to run for office, but wanted to get married, wanted to have a family, wanted to work in the private sector. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I just one by one checked off my goals and then it came to a point where I um, had an opportunity to be very involved in my community got my start literally working on the holiday parade in Laguna Niguel <laughs> I was an activist in my local community and decided that I would run for city council I had no idea what I was doing I just said I'm gonna go for it and by the way my mom thought I was crazy I had three little kids I was pregnant with my fourth and she said what are you doing and I said I'm gonna do this anyway because huh. I want to be a part of my community and that was what really started it and I lost my first race mm -hmm. um, but eventually ended up getting appointed to the City Council ran for the State Assembly ran for the State Senate now ultimately it's taken me 18 years to get here to Congress and I am so grateful but it was 
uh, me, I was running my own race. Mm. Um, I had set goals for myself. I knew what I wanted to do, but I knew that I had to have a good foundation to finally get to this position. And when you talk about raising the money, that is probably one of the hardest things that a candidate has to do. And every time I sit down and I talk to a candidate, whether it's female or male, I ask, are you um, okay with getting on the phone and asking people for money? Because if you're not willing to pick up that phone and make that phone call, do not even run for office because it's sort of the necessary evil in this business. You can't get your message out if you don't have any money. And I think part of the problem for women in raising money is a lot of times women will be in the workforce and do what I did, leave their job and stay home with their kids, and then they lose that network of people. And it's very difficult when you want to run for office to, again, get that network back. Mm -hmm. And that is one of the biggest challenges I think women face, besides being rejected all the time. Right. <laughs> which, <laughs> yes, which is tough. I actually ran for Congress myself, and I can attest to the fact that hearing no after no after no after no is tough on your ego. But I think you raise such an important point, because we see a lot, even women who do decide to get involved and do decide to run for office, frequently they want to wait until their kids are a little mm -hmm. older. And so they're a bit older when they decide to run for office. And it takes time to be able to amass power and these powerful committee chairmanships um, for anybody, male or female. So is that a challenge for women as well, more so than for men? Well, I think it's a challenge for both. Um, but I think a person, an individual, has to be willing to put the time in. Um, I'm a big believer in um, starting at the bottom and getting your power base behind you to get you elected. You make so many mistakes when you first run for office that I encourage people to run for school board, run for water district, run for city council, run at the local level so you can learn the mistakes. Mm. And too often we see people who are successful that decide now I want to be a U.S. Senator and have never run for office, now I want to be a governor and I've never run for office. And I think that that's part of the big problem, whether you're male or female, um, you need to get that base under you of people who know you and, and, and believe in you and support you. And, and many yeah. of those jobs are part-time too, which I think right. a lot of women don't know that you actually can be, and, and Laura knows this, you can run for local office in your communities and in many cases you don't have to quit your exactly. job. Exactly, right. And mm -hmm. many women have no idea, so they assume that they have to sort of abandon all their professional ambitions in order to do it, and it's not true for a lot of local seats. So I'm of two minds about that, because I think that's absolutely right, having that the benefit of that experience at the local level, not to mention that the people who are making the decisions that usually directly impact our lives are those local city council mm -hmm. members, are those local school board members. So those are incredibly important jobs. But, Laura, I also see that it's typically the guys who look in the mirror and they're like, I could be a U.S. Senator, I don't need to wait 10 years and build myself up, I'm ready to go for it, I'm going to go for it. And it typically is women who say, you know, and I need to start at the local level and I need to build my way up. Mm -hmm. So I also think there is something to be said for women being audacious and stepping out of their comfort zone and going for that higher level office. Right. But, you, you know, at the end of the day, it takes women being able to see themselves in these roles. I mean, it, it is, you, you, there are certain barriers that you have to overcome. And I think it's yet another example of why diversity is so important, because when young women out there don't see more of the, the talent that you have on this stage or at the city council level or in other elected um, office, uh, offices and, and positions, ultimately they have a harder time in their own mind thinking, that could be me, I could do that. So the example that you all set is huge, and so having more women that set that example is incredibly important. And the research, there, you know, there, there's, there's a lot of research that shows um, uh, Jennifer Lawless, who's a political science professor at American University, uh, one of her studies shows that it's the single greatest in inhibitor for women is that ability to see yourself mm -hmm. in those roles. And so clearly that, that mindset is incredibly powerful. I wanted to also pick up on a point that, that Mimi made earlier in terms of the network and not, you know, 
making sure that you maintain your professional contacts. It's so important from the standpoint of both the party committees, as I understand it, in terms of recruiting women to ultimately run for Congress. If they don't know you, if you're not part of those networks, it's like anything else, whether it's a corporate board selection process or other types of selections, if you're not part of that that group, right, and they don't know who you are, they may not know how incredibly talented you are. So it's incredibly important. That is absolutely the case. And, and the other piece, though, of Jennifer Lawless's research is that not only are women less likely to see themselves as candidates, they are less likely, Tulsi Gabbard, to be encouraged to run yeah. and to be asked to run, even when they have the same professional qualifications as their male counterparts. Yeah. Um, I, I know some of these studies have shown that women are typically asked seven times before they realize or accept, yes, I could be a candidate. I will say yes. <laughs> yeah. I will do this. I will jump in and run for office. Um, you know, I, I'm grateful for to my parents for my upbringing. I have three older brothers, so maybe that contributed to the whole thing of a very competitive five children family atmosphere. Um, I, I, unlike Mimi, never ever imagined I would run for office. Had no desire, and it wasn't because I thought well, it's something that's impossible or it's it's in the can't column. I just. I just wasn't interested, but ultimately decided to run for uh, the state house. I was 21 years old, took a break from school, because I wanted to do something about these environmental issues in Hawaii that I was very passionate about. Mm. Youngest um, person ever in, to in the state of Hawaii. To serve in and, the Hawaii state legislature. And every step of the way was told, like, you're 21 years old. What do you think you're doing? You have no place here. <laughs> Get out and go party, go to school, do things that 21-year-old people do. Uh, but I was really passionate about, um, uh, you know, what I cared about. And I was passionate about bringing voice and action to the concerns of my community. And like Mimi, I did not know what I was doing. I didn't have anyone in the party who was saying, please go do this. Here's all the tools. I had no benefactors or donors saying, I'll fund your campaign. Um, and it was really, really difficult. Um, I won the election, uh, and it was a, a great experience for me, but even at that point didn't think, well, I'm going to have a career in politics. Mm -hmm. uh, ended up leaving after one term and volunteering to deploy to Iraq with, with the National Guard, and ultimately it was interesting to me that I saw the same thing when I came back from my two deployments and decided to run for Congress, where many of the same people, when I was 21, who said, you can't do this, you're too young, you're too inexperienced, told me the same thing again when I was running for Congress, saying, just wait your turn, come yeah. back in another 15 years or so. Um, but it was focusing on the grassroots. It was focusing on really what is, what is truly wonderful and powerful about our democracy, where many, many people stood up and said, we want to change the direction of leadership for our state. And it wasn't because I had checked all those traditional political boxes mm -hmm. that equal a successful campaign. It was really focusing and staying um, true to uh, really people, the core of, of why we all, why we do what we do, why we're here. That's <laughs> such an unbelievably tough thing to do though, to push, th to have yeah. people, your family members saying, no, you need to wait, yeah. you're not ready, we don't believe you can do this, we don't believe you should do this, yeah. and to persist and push through that anyway, yeah. what gave you the strength to be able to do that? It, I mean, it really was the conviction of, of understanding in my heart of hearts why I was running for Congress. It wasn't because um, it was something I had always aspired to myself personally. It really, for me, came from my experiences that I had had overseas serving in the military, uh, understanding that we had fewer veterans, fewer people in a post-9-11 world who had ever worn the uniform than ever before in our country's history, and having uh, that vacuum um, of voices who represented you know, my generation of veterans and making these important decisions about our future. Um, and understanding that this was a responsibility to um, do my best to try to bring that voice uh, to our nation's capital. And so um, from that perspective, any time it became challenging, I would think about them. I would think about my brothers and sisters in uniform. I would think about those who didn't come home. And frankly, um, the stuff and the muck that happens in political campaigns uh, it became very clear mm. always, like, you know what, that doesn't matter. It feels a lot smaller when you put it in that perspective. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Lauren, one of the things that I think is so fascinating about the work that you're doing is you are looking not just at women who are going to run for office, but you're looking at women's voices and power in every part of the political process and in every part 
every little piece of the political process, women's voices are really not yeah. being heard. Talk to us about some of the research Yeah, that you've I mean, done. it's shocking, and I was shocked as I started to delve. I don't have a political background. I, I spent most of my career working on advancing women in the corporate realm. I've spent a lot of time you know, advising companies on this, but I started looking at this question of sort of what's happening, because as I looked at sort of the horizon around us, I thought, you know, I don't feel like the issues and perspectives of women around me are really well represented. Just small example, you know, wh whichever side you are on, on this issue, Issue. One a great example is the paid leave issue in the United States, which you know many women now appreciate. We are one of the only nations in the world that doesn't have any kind of um, mandated or protected paid maternity leave. And for working women, you know this is obviously very complicated. There are lots of questions about whether or not we should, you know, whether this should be federally mandated. But I think there are a lot of women who, you know, do have strong opinions on this, but whose voices are not heard. There is a bill that has been in Congress for the better part of a decade that deals with this issue. It's called the Families Act. And um, I got into working on women's issues because I wanted to lobby on behalf of that bill. The bill has literally been sitting in Congress year after year after year, and it gets like 100 co-sponsors, and then it goes nowhere. And when I talked to members of Congress about it, part of what they said was, well, you know, we don't have this groundswell of energy mm. coming from women in the electorate saying, demanding mm. that this be top of the priority list. So, you know, in your, every year there's something that comes up that's more important. So I started thinking about, well, how do we do that? How do we amplify women's voices? And it turns out that just as one small example, every year Congress receives two million fewer letters from women than men just as one small measure. Mm. Now, you can argue whether or not letter writing to co campaigns to Congress really make a difference, but two million fewer letters to they Congress. They do make a difference. OK, so <laughs> good. So talk about, I mean, some people say they don't, but go. I think they do. They do, do. Of course Absolutely. they do. Yeah, and so if you're not hearing from constituents on these issues, you know, how do you, I mean, that, that does affect the priority. So, so part of what we want women to do, and op-eds are a similar, you know, women are, write, are half as likely to write op-eds to major newspapers. So we want women to speak up not just when it's an election year, not just when it's time to maybe elect, you know, a president of whichever the, whichever gender, whichever party, but to really see ourselves as actors and to hold our legislators accountable for representing our perspectives, whatever those are, as diverse as they are, once they're in office. Yeah. Hmm. I, I think that's so interesting uh, of a phenomenon that it's not just at the top level. I mean, it is symptomatic of this sense, I think, of women that they don't see political service so much as community service. I think yeah. it speaks to that mentality if they're not engaging at the same level yeah. in in all aspects of the political process. Mm -hmm. What's your opinion, Congresswoman Walters? Is that is that what's going on here? Why are women participating less in every regard? Well, I think on the natural, women really have more on their plate than the men do. Sure. Um, if you're a working woman and you have children, um, you're still taking care of those kids. And I'll give you an example. Uh, when I was first elected to the state assembly. My youngest child was in third grade and my oldest child was in seventh grade. And I would commute, I'd leave Monday mornings and I would come back on Thursday uh, evening. And mm -hmm. so I was in Sacramento for pretty much the whole week. Wow. And my kids, if they didn't feel well, if they forgot something at home, if they um, had you know a problem at school, they were upset, I got the phone calls. If they didn't feel well in the morning, they called me and said, Mom, can I stay home from school? And you know, I'm hundreds of miles away. And my husband says, I'm sitting in the kitchen. Where are you? Why don't they come down and tell me? But my point is that if you're a mom, you're still taking care of your family. And you just might not have as much time on your hands if you're working too, to get involved and to write the letters, to get active. But I will say, I agree, the letters are important. But what sometimes happens when we are being lobbied on a particular issue, there's organizations out there mm -hmm. that will send like a, a, a letter to their whole group and say, send this letter into your representative. Well, we know that's an organized campaign on a it's particular a form issue. Letter. It's a form letter. So we can see through that. The letters that really have a big impact are the personal letters where somebody's writing to you and somebody didn't ask you to do it and give you some sort of form letter to send mm. in and tell you a real That's story a great, about mm -hmm. their lives. That's such a great tip for how to be most impactful with your voice. Laura, if you could speak to our very business-minded friends out here, the folks who are going to watch this online, what can they do to help get more women into our political process? 
you know, I think be more willing to engage, be more willing to engage directly in terms of making a financial investment as it relates to female candidates. Um, be more willing to speak out uh, about the fact that this is an important uh, component that you believe makes government operate more efficiently. Um, I think to pick up on a, on a point that, that Mimi made a moment ago, I suspect too that because women are so busy and have so much on their plate, right, not to overgeneralize, but this, but this is generally true, if they see dysfunction happening at the federal level, and they think, why would I waste my time, mm -hmm. right? right? You have all these things on your plate that has to have, a, have, have, a, have, a, have an impact on their willingness to ultimately engage. I think, look, talk to your organization about ways in which you can invest in a pipeline of young people. We've created um, a program in the summer that brings in young college age women that exposes them to people like Mimi and Tulsi you know, shows them this, this great example, teaches them a bit about Washington, and helps them realize that this is a dream that could actually be their dream, that mm. they can have an impact mm -hmm. as well. And so I would just encourage our, our you know, uh, attendees at the conference to think about ways that your organizations can actually invest differently as it relates to Washington. Uh, most big organizations have some infrastructure where you're, you know, obviously working on particular policies to move the, the needle on issues. But what I don't see very often are organizations that are willing to think very holistically about their strategy so that a component is focused on actually moving the needle around diversity in Congress and marrying that up with their programs to increase diver diversity within their own organizations. We think that can make a big difference. Um, Congresswoman Gabbard, so there is a pretty high profile woman who's running for office right now, Hillary Clinton. Um, and the could, second as of next week. Yes, and Carly Fiorina looks set to uh, throw her hat in the ring as well, so we'll have a woman on the Republican side as well. If we did end up with our first female president, how much of an impact would that have on the minds of young girls who are thinking about potentially running for office one day? You know, I think the fact that we are um, even having this conversation that, you know, it, it looks to be, uh, I mean, it, it's something that's become a part of kind of the normal conversation, even though it hasn't happened yet. Mm -hmm. I think it looks imminent, uh, whether it's this election or the next election, but it's something that has become, I think, more of a societal norm. And I, I talk to grades, I've, I've spoken to grade school students before, um, and, you know, I ask, how many of you want to become president one day? And half the kids in the room uh, will raise their hands, boys and girls, and it's become something that, um, uh, thankfully, which is a great thing, is already being like, yeah, I'm going to be president. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go, you know, to Mars. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that for kids who are who are coming up now. So I think we have come a long way. I think when we do have uh, for the first woman uh, in the White House, it will only further uh, strengthen what is is already inching closer to becoming. Um, something that uh, should be a, a norm. But we have to work at it, and this is the thing that what I worry about is we've are just as Bar the election of Barack Obama as the first black president um, didn't necessarily change the entire reality for African Americans in the United States. Neither will electing our first woman president. And what I worry about going into this election cycle is that we will again focus so solely on one person sort of being the be all and end all. The reality is is that as we've seen with this current president, no president can be effective if they don't have support in Congress. Mm. So, you know, that's the first thing. And then the second issue is of course that I what I worry about is that young women, yes, they may be inspired, but if they see that as still so unattainable and so far away and Hillary had to raise a billion dollars and she's the most famous woman in the world anyway, we still have have to work at this and what I fear is that we will miss the opportunity or we will we will think we don't have to work as hard on the engagement and participation of women in the political process just because we have her mm. we know that we women are not just accomplished right? no and good to go that, and women are not just gonna vote for a woman running because she's a woman that's so certainly and true. I think that's the value of special not voting for Hillary sorry <laughs> <laughs> it is true right? I mean, I mean it's, yeah. we don't want to reduce this conversation down right. to like this very simple put a woman in the White House, check the box. Yep. We know it doesn't work that way. It's no, you have to get women that. at all levels of the process. For what it's worth, my daughter is seven. I asked her if she would run for president, and she said no, because she likes her weekends. <laughs> so at least she's got like the work-life balance thing in perspective, I guess. Um, we do have a Republican woman who is we going do. to run, Carly Fiorina. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you think 
it's important that we that you do have a woman running on the Republican side and do you think it's important ultimately that whoever the Republican ticket is that one of the two the president or the vice president is a woman I I do I, I firmly believe that I'm very excited that Carly's gonna run um, I don't know what her chances are but to have a woman on the stage is something that's really important and I am a big firm believer in uh, whoever our nominee is on the Republican side if it is a, a male that they um, have a female vice president uh, candidate. I think it's very important. We have five women on the Republican side who are governors and who have been, some of, some of them have been reelected. They've proven themselves in tough states. And there's a big opportunity for us. I think we are building the bench um, and I think we will have an opportunity. But I do believe we need to have, especially if Hillary is the nominee, on the Democrat side, we have to neutralize it and we have to be practical about it. But we can't have just a woman for the sake of being a woman. Right. We have to have an accomplished woman, and we certainly do have several women that are accomplished. You so have a number of women. We who do. Would be excellent we do. Choices. And think about it um, women in politics, women in elected office, we only got the right to vote in 1920 in this country. It's crazy. And <laughs> government moves very slow. So, so 100 years? 100 yeah. years, maybe. You know, we're coming more up years on that 100th we'll anniversary. Yeah. You know, hopefully we'll have a female president before then. Yeah. I'm hoping we reach some sort of tipping point where the pace of change speeds up a little bit more. Um, I do want to turn over the floor to all of you for questions to our amazing panel. Um, and I also actually wanted to take a moment. We have a lot of wonderful women in this room, and we do have a few guys. I want to thank the guys who came to this panel and are listening to this conversation because obviously you are an important part of making this change as well. I, I, I think it's, I mean, bravo to the men that are here. I will say that I think it's a little bit indicative of this conversation that there are so few men in the room. And I think, you know, we did have a, I mean, I, the Milken Institute has done an amazing job this year making sure women's voices are well represented. But there was a panel an hour ago on the 114th Congress that was an entirely male panel, and they did not talk at all about women in Congress, and that is one of the most important things on the 114th. So, you know, it is important that this be a national conversation and not just our conversation. And, you know, it's what we're all trying to do is to bring this to the national media to make this a more significant part of the Peace discussion. Of the discussion. Mm -hmm. All right, great point. I think we have a question right here. And thank you, Crystal. I watch you a lot. You're great. Thank you. I like to. We like to hear that. <laughs> I, I, have, I have a concern about what you were talking about, about young women not being involved in the political process. I was privileged here in Los Angeles. microphone here. Um, I'm concerned about the fact that young young women are not very concerned about the political process. I have three granddaughters who are teenagers, and I've been political my whole life. We started in LA many, many years ago, the Women's Political Committee, Lisa Speck and uh, a group of women. And that was a long, that was in the 70s. And in fact, I raised the first um, political event for Dukakis when he was running for president here where I got women to pay $1,000 to come to have lunch with him, hmm. which he didn't come, he, but we worked it out <laughs> later. <laughs> I mean, I was really upset. Yes, the party didn't think that the women would pay $1,000 to wow. see somebody, and we had raised $30,000 for that lunch, and then they canceled it, and then he came. <laughs> then there was another event here at the Hilton, which was about a month later. We I can't understand why you didn't win. I don't know. <laughs> I, it, it was the first. But what I'm saying is, how do we energize not only the women, the young women, mm -hmm. that are moving into the business world, mm -hmm. but we're moving into politics? It seems so ugly yeah. and not a kind of a, a career that's going to make a difference, and it does. I'm a businesswoman. Without women in Congress making decisions, women have very few seats at the table to get money yeah. in business, too. I'll, I'll, I'll grab that. Um, I think it's up to our generation, well, my generation, I'm older than some of these women uh, on the panel here, but it's up to us, because women are going to have to do it ourselves. We can't rely on the men to do it, so we're the ones that are going to have to serve as the mentor for the young people and try to get them engaged. Um, one of my goals as a member of Congress is to do just that. My, my daughters now are 23 and 21, and then I have two sons. 
Um, and I'm very proud to say that my 21-year-old is running for student body president of her college. That's great. That's great. And she's very involved, but um, probably because I've, you know, I've been out there doing this her whole life. Mm. But it really is up to us, and it, it's our job to make sure that we engage them and provide training for them and opportunities like that. Yeah. Kelsey, do you want to? Yeah, I think more? it's. I'd love to hear from you too. You know, Paul. You know, the political world is tough. It is ugly. There's uh, a, a necessity to have uh, an armor on, but that armor only comes from um, the motivation of why we do what we do. Uh, and I think that's where um, it's up to all of us to challenge um, those young women, women of any generation, people of any generation, who complain about the world that we live in today in this country and say, what are you doing about it? That each of us have a responsibility. Yes, there's mentorship, there's encouragement, there are, um, you know, growing the pipeline. These are all things that we need to do, but ultimately, uh, however each of us chooses to get involved in the process, whether it's running yourself, whether it's advocacy work, whether it's uh, supporting people who run, uh, whether it's just getting out and voting in the first place, I think there is a disconnect, especially mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. the millennial generation, yeah. Yeah. Uh, from highly successful, highly talented people, uh, great innovators who are saying, why should I get involved with this dysfunctional entity called government? Uh, and when you start connecting the dots of saying, well, you know, do you care about tax taxes and tax reform? Do you care about, you know, potholes being filled on your street and your trash being picked up on time? Do you care about, you know, uh, college debt and how we can mm -hmm. fix this issue in our country? Immigration, take your pick on an issue. If you care about any of these issues which touch all of us one way or the other, criminal justice reform, what are you doing about solving that problem? Because each of us has a role to play in that and each mm -hmm. of us has an individual responsibility to do our part. Mm -hmm. And, you know, don't overlook something that may seem so small, but that can have such a big impact, and that is talking to your children. Yeah. Talking to your children about government, talking to your children about service, whatever that service mm -hmm. happens to look like. Yeah. Because studies also show, and I suspect if we surveyed the two of you, you probably had conversations around the dinner, yeah. the, the dinner table with your parents. My father was a, was a city councilman uh, mm -hmm. growing up. They weren't particularly mm -hmm. politically active outside of the community, but they were very engaged in their in their um, community service and, and in serving in that way. And so it's an, a really important example that each of us can have those conversations with our children, bring them to Washington, expose them to the power of, of what happens there and the importance of that, of that level of service. Yeah, I always like to, to say when someone says Washington sucks or it's dysfunctional or the government's dysfunctional, Yes, it is. That's why we need you engaged, right? right? That's not the reason to step back. That's the reason that we need you involved. And I think a lot of people have gotten that mixed up in their head. Mm -hmm. Did you want to add? Or? Yeah, no, I mean, they all captured it beautifully. I mean, I, I'm sort of shocked. Look, millennials particularly are incredibly passionate about giving back and about public service. Mm -hmm. I mean, they disproportionately yeah. turning down jobs at Goldman Sachs to go work at Kiva.org, even if that means they're living in their parents' basement right. for the teach first for five years. Or, or Teach yeah. for America. Or Teach for America. So we know that we actually do have a general generation that cares deeply about making the world better. The massive disconnect is they do not see government as a way to do that. Mm -hmm. And they're flocking to Silicon Valley and flocking to industries that have largely disconnected from the political process. We're actually um, doing some work this year. We're going to be bringing this kind of conversation to Silicon Valley, particularly to women in tech, because we think there are a whole pipeline of women who a lot of them have made very, you know, done very well. They should be thinking about public service as the next part. Of so we have to, as a country, we have to start reconnecting the concept that public service and public good can happen through government. And that is one of the biggest pieces, mm. I think one of the biggest broken links. That seems you know? like such a theme of this, of this whole hour. Go ahead, did you have a question? Yeah, do you agree that if, I mean, it's astounding if you think about it, that we talk about pay equity with all the powerful women in the room and in this country. We talk about, um, mm. you know, need for gender parity and um, you know, equal man's pay, you know. But I find it interesting that during Sandy Hook, we could slaughter six, you know, year old children and that women didn't activate to make sure that gun control was changed, right. that, that we didn't have semi-automatic guns in people's hands. And yet that, the killing of our children, didn't even unify mothers on the right or the left to make a change. So I guess yeah. when I looked at that issue, I saw that our buying power as mothers and women, more now as heads of households, the breadwinners, if we understood that we controlled two trillion plus yeah. in consumer buying power, if yeah. we understood our leverage, would it make a difference 
in our sense of entitlement to actually ask for the changes that we know are just simply right and fair. That's a really good point. Uh, if, I, if I could take a point of privilege yeah. and try to tackle that one, um, there were a lot of moms who organized after Sandy Hook and continue to organize. There's a whole group, national network of, of moms who have come together around that issue. But I think it speaks to the way that Washington works and that some of the issues that, that you're exploring, Lauren, around how we can be most powerful. I mean, some of the basics of gun control, A, there was a bipartisan bill in the Senate, um, so there was support on both sides of the aisle, and B, when, it, when you pulled on it, it pulled very well across the population. But those weren't the voices who were heard the loudest in Congress. It was the voices of people who were giving money. It was the voices of groups like the NRA that were very well organized um, that really put the kibosh on that But bill. the letters also skewed. So since Chelsea is going That's to support right. that, letters actually do make a difference. There yeah. is actually data on this. And the there were, I think, 50-something bills on gun control in Congress over the, in the two years around, around Sandy Hook. The overwhelming majority of the letters that got written to Congress about those bills were against. That's and right. we work with something called That's Popbox, right. which is a uh, which is a, a, a site that helps people write letters to Congress. And they pulled the gender data for us, and it skewed enormously male. And one of the reasons for that is that some of the organizations, like Heritage Foundation and others, that do have a very active male. And again, wherever you stand on this issue, they have a very active group of male members who, when there is an issue, and they they don't just write the form letters, they actually go on and they write their personal letters about why they oppose these bills. If you go on Popbox and you look at any number of issues that would you would consider maybe a woman's issue, and I'm, I generally reject that term, but let's just call it that for now, the letters overwhelmingly skew against, and it is because some of the organizations activate their male members to write those letters. It's not the only reason things do or don't pass, but it is a factor. We have to, we are organizing, I think, on some issues like that, but there's a whole panoply of ways that we could be speaking up more. Again, whatever side of the issue you're on on that, for or against, we're not, talk, we're not speaking up on either side. I know, Laura, you look like you were like in a... Wanting to jump agree, in. Agree, not agree. I mean, that's <laughs> a big part, isn't it? Yeah, talk to, I mean, you're, you were an insider to this process. So talk to us about right. whose voices are heard and what could make a difference in terms of women who want to get involved. Um, you know, I, I think both both Tulsi and Mimi can talk even more eloquently than I can because they're they're the, the folks that are receiving these letters. So, um, you know, it is important to, 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 to communicate to elected officials to to engage in a way that maybe you hadn't thought about in the past. And I think, you know, corporations have a tremendous amount of power and frankly increasingly have a responsibility to do mm -hmm. a bit more to have this conversation. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that there are enough people that are willing to talk at the, at the, at the top of the food chain to talk about how important this element of diversity is as it relates to the most effective and efficient functioning of government. You know, 50% of our population is female, 20% uh, you know, of, of the Congress is female. So there's clearly a discrepancy in terms of whether that really is the role of representative democracy. And I think we have to ask ourselves a, a hard question. If you have these programs inside your organization as it relates to uh, training and empowering women, uh, cultivating women leaders in your organization, getting women on your board, getting women on your management teams, is the same thing true as it relates to your interactions with Congress? Yeah. And you know, we at PwC tend to think that it is, and we hope that other people will will begin to to you know to also think about their approach in a similar fashion. We and think that's women important. have to give money, yeah. also. Yeah. They do. Women they give to. so much less to. money than yeah. men, and. Sorry, but unfortunately, our political system, it matters. And think about how many women control the checkbooks in their home. I right. know I control it in mine. I used to be a contributor before I actually um, got serious about running. But women control a lot of the budgets. And so you're absolutely right. Uh, women have got to start writing those checks mm -hmm. and standing up for what they believe in in that respect. Absolutely. So, and on the Democratic side, I'll just add one detail about this. So, as you all know, obviously, Emily's List is a very powerful force. They have millions and millions of dollars that they give. On the Republican side, there isn't the same level of financial infrastructure to support women candidates. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I'm so passionate about I'm a Democrat. I actually now do support financially Republican women candidates, partially because I, I believe so deeply that it's the 
it's for the benefit of all of us to support women on both sides of the aisle. Yeah. Republicans are now stepping up more mm -hmm. to build the infrastructure to support women candidates. There are more PACs that are emerging, more efforts to fundraise for those women. So I think that's yeah. changing. But I mean, fundamentally, the problem is, is that men assume that women are giving to women candidates, and women uh, are not doing it at the same rate as men are. So, you know, as even wealthy, powerful women who do incredible amounts of philanthropy and give to all kinds of charities aren't necessarily seeing political giving as a way to extend their legacies and their impact. Yeah. And, and they should, because it's a big miss. And the assumption that women are giving is the ultimate, it, it's another, in other words, the men are sort of assuming, well, women will just take care of it. They'll take care of each other. And sadly, it's, it's just not, it's yeah. not, it's not doing the Giving trick. to politics isn't icky. It's absolutely yeah. vital in the process that we have. I think we have a question there at the back. Thank you for being here, sir. Uh, I'm here for a reason. I'm actually an elected uh, constitutional officer in Nevada. Awesome. And uh, as any guy will tell you, it's tougher to run against a woman than a guy. You can figure out the reasons. Number two, I ran against a woman and I beat her. And I beat her not because I was a guy or she was a lady. Uh, she was incompetent and she ran a bad campaign. Mm -hmm. uh, there were two or three other, uh, there were two other uh, women on the ballot. They lost one because she was an incompetent and, and uh, ran a bad campaign. The other one was incompetent, ran a bad campaign, and didn't have any experience. Mm -hmm. okay. um, I, I think Congresswoman Walters really said it, is that it really, uh, we have an experienced lady and we have a passionate lady. Both of you will win. Uh, I think our system is very democratic. The voters know, they know a lot more than yeah. most, uh, most people give them credit for. Um, and they will pick the best candidate, not always, but most of the time. Mm -hmm. And as I said, I, I think, as I said, it's a credit to the two women who are on the panel here. Uh, as I say, one with the experience, now you're getting experience, another with passion. That's what voters look for. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and the voters make the right choice if you do say so yourself. Huh? Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, in my instance, uh, they did. But I, I think it really is, uh, again, it's always easy to oversimplify and, and say man yeah. versus women. Uh, I don't think Carly Fiona is a particularly attractive candidate. She has absolutely no political experience. And to the lady over here who was complaining about gun control, uh, the most vocal uh, gun proponent in the Nevada legislature is a woman. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, well, I mean, uh, yeah, yeah it, uh, Lauren, speak to that no, because I mean, we're listen. talking about yeah. overall, right? We're not talking right. about specifically mm -hmm. Michelle Bachman or specifically Hillary Clinton. We're talking about research that says overall, yeah. when you have more women, women pass more legislation, they work in a more collaborative way, they focus on different issues, they engage with their constituents yeah, in a different look, way. Yeah, and look, just as no one, look, I don't know any women in business who are saying that we should stick someone on the board of a Fortune 500 company just because she's female and we want more women on the board. No one is saying that, and in fact, in some places where there have been quotas, it's had a negative effect because you do need qualified professional people who know what they're doing to take these jobs on. And I think, you know, we saw some of the, that in the, you know, in a, with the last time we had a woman vice presidential candidate, they quite, it wasn't just that she was a woman, it was a lot of cynicism that she got put there just because she was a woman and she ultimately, the voters decided, you know, she yeah. was not qualified. So, I mean, look, no one here is advocating that we need women for women's sake. What we're saying, and we're not saying that just because a woman runs that she should automatically win, it's a democracy. Mm -hmm. But the, the reality is, is that we do have a big gap there and and if we believe in the future of our country and we believe it should be representative democracy, we have to find a way to make sure that it is. And, uh, and that doesn't mean just sticking someone there because they look like X, Y, or Z. That right. is not what yeah. I think any that of us would advocate. I correct. think we actually do correct. more harm to ourselves as women. Yes. And that's not what we want to do. Right. Mm -hmm. We want to train women, get women qualified so that when they're running in a race, and whether it be against another woman or against a man, may the best person win. We just want the woman to have the same opportunity right. to be competitive. And that's what we have to do. And Laura, sure. I think part of what you brought up earlier was the research that shows if you take a group of women and you take an equally qualified group of men, <laughs> the men are about a third more likely right. to see themselves as qualified to run for office, even though these are two equally qualified Right. pools and that's what or we need even to address when they're less qualified yeah. than, than the, yeah. the you know that that women are more inclined to second guess themselves as to whether they're qualified mm -hmm. than an unqualified man is and so i do want to echo the point 
there isn't anyone who's advocating women for, for women's sake, myself included. So we want to be really clear about that. But it's unconscionable that you only have 20% of all the qualified women out there, incredibly smart people, including the women at this conference, right, who are very qualified to run for office. And having that not only diversity of gender, but diversity of perspectives, mm -hmm. just, just as Tulsi talks about. She brings an incredible perspective, as does Mimi, um, based on their professional experience, what they can bring to this process of governing is incredibly important. But it's, you know, it's crazy that you only have 20% of the, of the, you know, the 50% of the, of, the, of the female population that's qualified to run for Congress. I just don't think that is the case. Which, which is reflected uh, in the corporate world, which is reflected Absolutely. on yeah. boards. I mean, this is a reflection, unfortunately, across the board Absolutely. of incredibly talented and qualified people who um, are not being asked to serve in these positions, and many of whom are kind of either creating their own companies or pushing their way there. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think we have time for one more. Go ahead, please. Yes, you, you raised a point that I wanted to, to go back to. So you've got this group of equally qualified people, men and women, and the men are raising their hands and the women aren't, and you see it in the business world too, you know, yeah. the yeah. world that I come from. Absolutely. So why is that? Is You know, we hear a lot about the confidence gap, and, and mm -hmm. And if that is why it is, what can we do about that? It, it's a great question. We've talked a lot uh, uh, this morning about setting that example of helping women see themselves in that role and that the research shows that that's at least one consistent factor. You have to take all of these variables into consideration, but the example is important. Um, helping young women, uh, giving them the background, exposing them to leadership at various levels is also really important. The, you know, the confidence components that you hear a lot about are also really important. I don't think you can look at one single factor and check the box and it's done. I actually think you have to look at the problem very holistically and think about all these different elements from the way we talk to our children, the example that we set, the exposure that we give them to other types of leaders, to thinking about themselves in these roles, all those things taken together, I think, are you know part at least part of the puzzle. But yeah. this is a yeah. difficult, difficult problem that is not not solved with one single answer. Yeah. No. You know, if I could jump in yeah. um, on that point, you know, many of us have been taught you can't have it all. You know, you want to be a mom, you want to have family, you can't have it all, and that's what we've been spoken. Society has said, and that is just absolutely wrong. And we have to make sure our young people understand they can have it all. They might not have, be able to have it all right this second, but they can have it all if they set their mind to it. Um, my husband, and he was actually here earlier and he left, but um, when I decided to run for office and I got elected to the state assembly, he moved his business right next to the kids' school. Hmm. I mean, we were really a team, and we worked together to make sure we made it work. And so I'm trying to change that perception with women who don't think they can't have it all, because they can. And we need to start telling them they can. Yeah. Um, it's one team. really simple thing that you can do is you all, I know at this conference, probably are qualified to run yourself, but you certainly know women who would be fabulous candidates, fabulous public servants. Mm -hmm. Tell them to run office. Every time they hear it, they become a little bit more likely to actually do it. Um, and write the first check, <laughs> exactly. most importantly. Um, thank, exactly. you thank, thank you all. Thank you so much to our panel. Thank you. Thank you.